On March 6, 1998, an employee at the Lottery Corp headquarters in Connecticut walked into work with an evil plan in his mind. Shortly after settling down and working for a little bit, what he would do was absolutely sickening. This is the Lottery Massacre. Hello, friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I... I... Wait. What do I do again? Oh, that's right. On here, I specialize in true crime. Today's video is a very uncovered case that happened in 1998. It's twisted and interesting, but stay tuned for some bizarre occurrences. Matthew Edward Beck was born on March 29th of 1962 in New London, Connecticut to his mother Priscilla and his father Donald. He was the youngest of four children. He had an older sister and two older brothers. Matthew was a smart child and his family lived in the outskirts of Ledyard in a rustic house that had a pretty big fence. The family had horses and a big backyard. Matthew's father, Donald, worked as an industrial biologist for Pfizer for several decades, and it was said that he apparently would shoot small animals and that Matthew's mother, Priscilla, had multiple sclerosis, which made her, for the most part, bedridden. Before she became a mother, she was a medical technician, but when her and Donald became parents, she quit to become a stay-at-home mother. Now, what happened during Matthew's childhood up until high school wasn't really known. It just wasn't talked about. But we do know that apparently his family was very much into guns, with Matt growing up with a gun at the hip. And in high school, he ran cross country, and his teacher said that he was a fine young man and a good student. Little did they know the evil that was to come. Matt graduated from high school in 1980, and within the next year, he started to attend the Florida Institute of Technology. Now, it's unclear exactly as to when, but Matt really started to get depressed and began to have thoughts of taking his own life. In either 1980 or 1981, Matt cut his own wrist, but his father said that the wounds were superficial and that he doesn't know why his son would have done that. In college, Matt was on the track team, and in 1984, he graduated and earned himself a bachelor's degree in business. After graduating, Matt began working at the IRS, but that was short-lived. His next job would be working as a security officer at the United Nuclear Uranium Plant located in Montville. Here, Matt met a friend named Richard, and these two remained friends for several years. Richard said Matt was a normal, cool guy who he would bowl and golf with. He also said that Matt collected guns for target practice, and that he also really enjoyed playing paintball. We'll bring up Richard a bit more later, but a few years would pass, and in April of 1989, Matt took a job as an accountant with the State Department of Special Revenue. About two years would pass since Matt had taken the job at the State Department, and in 1991, he once again tried to take himself out. That was the second time, and it's not specified as to what happened. All that said is that it did happen. For several years, things again appeared to be okay. Now, I also want to just bring up the fact that at some point, Matt was able to get a permit to carry a pistol. You also have to remember that at about this point, he was, for the most part, normal. On June 13th of 1996, a man named Otto R. Ott Brown wrote to Matt offering him a position as an accountant with something that was newly created called the Connecticut Lottery Corp. It was an agency set up to administer the state lottery. Matt accepted the job almost right away and was incredibly excited because he had thought that this was his chance to make something of himself. Natho then wrote Matt another letter saying congratulations and that he looks forward to what they're going to accomplish in this new venture. And it was around the summer of 1996 that Matt shaved his head and grew a goatee because he was balding. This made him look severe or angry. 
and some people said it looked like he lost weight and got very pale. A lot of the articles stated that he shaved his head a few months before tragedy would strike, but in reality, he changed his look about two years before. I know this because a guy named Joseph, who was good friends with Matt, said so. They were a part of the same union for the Lottery Corp. By late 1996-ish, Matt was considered to be well-educated, super intelligent, and a dedicated worker. He would put in long hours at the Lottery Corp to make sure that the job was done. Matt was looked at as an expert with computers and someone that was willing to help anyone. He had nieces and nephews who he loved very much, and they loved him very much. It was also said that Matt was very competitive with board games and games in general that he would typically win. Matt had an active social life with a pretty big group of friends, and they would go to rock concerts and jump in the mosh pits. Matt also played a lot of racquetball at a nearby gym, and he went to Florida pretty oftenly. By literally all accounts, until a bit later, Matt was a good, hard-working guy who liked to have fun. But then, things started to change. Now, the exact dates are unknown, but sometime between the summer of 1996 and January of 1997, Matt started to become delusional and showed signs of depression. He told his friend, who I mentioned earlier, named Richard, about this on the phone on January 4th of that year. Matt said to Richard that he was sick of his life and started to complain about everything, including his parents, his job, and his girlfriend. Now, I didn't mention this before, but yes, Matt had a girlfriend, and her name was Kim. Kim also worked at the Lottery Corp, and everyone that worked there knew that Matt and Kim were dating. Not any information is out there about their relationship besides the fact that they eventually broke up. But while Matt was talking to Richard, he said that he was holding a knife and was thinking of taking his own life. Richard was afraid that Matt was going to do something dumb, and so he called the police. The police eventually arrived at Matt's apartment. He lived alone with his family's parrot named Captain in Cromwell, which is a town in Connecticut. I guess the police knocked and they didn't hear anything, and so they decided to just go inside. On the kitchen table, they found a large bayonet, but Matt was nowhere to be found. Not long after this, he asked two of his friends if they could check his apartment for him because he said that something strange was going on there. I don't know if he was referencing the police, but eventually Matt was found at a friend's house, and after he was found, the police investigation ended. Not long after this, Matt's father and his sister basically made him go and see a psychiatrist whose name was Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith assessed Matt and prescribed him a glue box, an antidepressant that's used to treat obsessive compulsive disorder, and also lorazepam, an anti-anxiety drug similar to Valium. Matt was also prescribed Ambien, which is a sleeping pill. A few weeks later, in March, Matt had once again attempted to take his own life, this time using pills. Donald would frequently call Matt, and during a phone call, he knew by the sound of Matt's voice that something was wrong. And so Donald drove almost an hour away to Matt's house, dragged him out of the bed, and took him to an emergency room to have his stomach pumped. The doctor said, thank God that he lived. At the time, Donald was in agreement. When Matt went back to see Dr. Smith, the doctor asked Matt why he would want to take his own life. Matt said that everything seemed so hopeless. Donald said that Matt was zombie-like and had a fixed stare, that there was zero inflection in his voice, that Matt was not ranting or raving, but he was withdrawn and subdued. Donald afterwards called Matt's friend Richard and told him what happened. Matt and Richard were supposed to go on a trip to Cancun, Mexico together two days into the future, but obviously they never went. After Matt's attempt, his parents got him admitted to the Elmcrest Psychiatric Institute located in Portland. Not long after this, 
Richard actually visited Matt to see how he was and what happened. Matt downplayed it and said that his parents overreacted by admitting him to the hospital. Matt told Richard that he was fine, but in reality, he wasn't. Also, while Matt was in the hospital, a boss of his named Frederick Rubelman III asked about him and wanted to make sure he was okay. Matt's father, Donald, told him that Frederick had called and Matt said that no one at the lottery cared for him. Donald told Matt to give them the benefit of the doubt and for goodness sake, call them back. From this point forward, Matt became angrier and more isolated. People began to become afraid of him and what he might potentially do. Now sometime again in 1997, Matt was hospitalized for the second time, but it's not stated when or why. Somehow, neither of these hospitalizations warranted his gun permit being taken away. By July of that year, specifically July 25th, Matt applied for a job to become a state auditor, but he didn't make it past the first cut. Also, a big issue is that when Matt was first hired, he was hired as an accountant, but they assigned him to a higher level computer job without the additional pay. Apparently, he would do data processing and installing software, and that wasn't in his job description. That particular job paid $2 more an hour. A few weeks would go by, and on August 18th of 1997, Matt, who was getting more and more angry, filed a grievance against the Lottery Corp because of what they were doing to him. Now, I believe before this grievance, he filed another one, or maybe it was that one. But Michael Logan, the information services manager at the Lottery Corp, denied it. Not exactly sure why, but I do know that happened. This made Matt furious. Eventually, the grievance process was accepted, but Matt was getting worse and worse. About two months would go by, and on October 15th, Matt went to see his psychiatrist. He told him that he was experiencing harmful and dangerous thoughts and that he had temper tantrums, sleep problems, and obsessive thoughts. Matt also told Dr. Smith that he felt a lack of support at work and that he filed a grievance. Dr. Smith diagnosed Matt this day with an intermittent explosive disorder, paranoid traits, and monopolar depression. In the meantime, however, he was getting angrier and doing everything he could to try to fix the problem. A few weeks prior to this, he scheduled a meeting with the lottery personnel director that would be set towards the end of the month. On October 28th, a critical meeting was held with Matt. The people that were there were Alfred Dupoy, the security director at the Lottery Corp, and Karen Mahegan, the lottery personnel director or the director of human resources. The reason that Alfred was there was because Karen was afraid of what Matt might do. Specifically, she said she was afraid he'd blow his top. Karen talked to Alfred about this meeting about a month before, and both of them were aware that Matt had problems outside of work involving depression and other things. Karen told Alfred that they were going to tell Matt that he was going to be put back on his old job and that he wasn't getting a raise and that someone else was going to be put into that position, and that any back pay he was owed was going to be put off. Honestly, that's pretty messed up that they would do that to him. I'm not excusing anything, but still. Apparently, Matt looked very angry during this meeting, but didn't say much, even when he was told about what was going to happen. When Alfred was asked about the meeting between Matt and Karen, he said, to everyone's surprise, Matt was extremely happy with the outcome of that particular meeting. The union people were happy, the management was happy, and that was the end. We said, geez, we're glad that it's resolved positively and that Matt was very accepting to it. What a relief. Also, apparently Alfred had brought his own gun to the meeting because him and Karen were afraid of what Matt might do. But Matt's good friend, and also union representative, Joseph Mudry, said that Matt wasn't happy, not even close to it. He also said that Alfred wasn't ever at the meeting, which is a bit confusing because it's in newspapers. 
However, Joseph said that the two people who were at the meeting were Karen and Frederick Rubelman III, who was the Lottery Corps' vice president of operations. Frederick, about a month before the meeting, became uneasy about Matt's access to the lottery computer system. He was afraid that Matt would damage the system if he became angry enough. So Fred decided that Matt should be put into his lower job of accountant duties, and he talked to Ott Brown about this. Both of the men agreed. This is the reason that Matt was assigned into his lower position again. After the meeting happened though, Matt went back to his computer to retrieve some files, and he found out that he had been locked out of the computer system. The next day, on October 29th, Matt had went to see his psychiatrist again and told him that he became angry and enraged at work and that he had ideation. Dr. Smith said that he could see that Matt had a profound primitive sense of right and wrong. Matt told the doctor that he felt his employer was trying to make his life miserable. Dr. Smith told Matt that he advised him he should take a leave of absence from work for about six months until April. Dr. Smith also noted that Matt showed an increase in paranoia, anger, and threats. Two days later, Matt randomly left work in the middle of his shift, and thus began the extended absence. Now, for the next several months, he would become more and more withdrawn. Underneath of his eyes were dark circles. He was becoming obsessed and twisted by this situation daily, and sending letters to literally anyone that he could. Matt requested to be transferred to the Department of Special Revenue, the Department of Social Services, or the University of Connecticut Health Center. He also applied for jobs with the state auditors, which he was denied, and at Central Connecticut State University. Not only that, but Matt also applied to the Mash and Tuck at Pequot Gaming Commission, and they reached back out to him asking for information. It was unclear as to whether or not they were going to hire him, but it seemed like they were interested. Matt was obviously trying to get out of the Lottery Corp, but at the same time, his grudge just wouldn't let him go. Shortly after this, Matt had went to some local newspapers and told them that the Lottery Corp was doing illegal things, such as inflating the numbers of how much the jackpots were. A finding was done, and everything that Matt said was true. They were inflating the numbers. Apparently, also, employees were finding loopholes to win, and there were a few other big things. By November 18th, Matt had went to see his psychiatrist again and told him that he was very angry at his employer and stressed out because of work. Matt said that he wrote letters to the attorney general. He called the state police, the governor's office, and the FBI about the problems at his work. Matt's paranoia was clearly increasing drastically. On December 2nd, Matt went to see Dr. Smith again and told him his anxiety was bad because of the Lottery Corp and that this led to verbally explosive outbursts. Now who was on the receiving end of those isn't known. Perhaps his parents? But Matt said that he didn't feel respected or treated fairly and that he was unable to tolerate a discussion of current events regarding his employment. Two weeks later, on December 16th, Matt saw Dr. Smith again and expressed being angry some more. Two more weeks later, and on December 30th, Matt went to see Dr. Smith and told him yet again about his work problems and how upset he was because of what was happening. He told Dr. Smith that he wasn't eating or sleeping well because of this and that he entertained vengeful thoughts towards his employers and showed increased agitation and paranoia about his work. This same day, Matt said that he had terrible anxiety because of a hearing that was going to take place on January 15th regarding the work issues. Dr. Smith decided to recommend that instead of returning in April, Matt should return sometime late in June. About 11 days later, on January 10th of 1998, Matt went to Dr. Smith again and told him that he felt lied to and unsupported by his superiors at work. Matt got very angry during this day and told Dr. Smith that he had ideation. Five days later, on January 15th, some decent news came in when part of Matt's grievance was resolved. 
The state lottery officials acknowledged that Matt was assigned duties outside of his job description, and they agreed to look into the possibility of compensating Matt with back pay. This made Matt pretty happy, and his father said that he felt he was ready to go back to work. Now on January 27th, Matt went back to Dr. Smith, and this visit confuses me. Matt told Dr. Smith that on February 5th, he was about to have a hearing with his bosses. I couldn't find what that hearing was about. Matt also said that he had a considerable amount of anxiety and insomnia, and that he had dreams of violent outbursts and fears of violent outbursts that were mostly directed against himself, but also directed against others, especially when he returns to work. So Dr. Smith, for some reason, decided to change his recommendation and suggested that Matt, instead of returning to work on June 1st, that he return to work on March 1st. Matt told his psychiatrist that he was basically having homicidal ideation. And so Dr. Smith, instead of warning people or pushing back the date that Matt should go to work, which should have been never, he moved it forward by months. Why? on earth after hearing what he did that day did he think that was a good move reading that genuinely hurt my brain but by february 10th matt went to see dr smith again and all that was said is that matt was preoccupied with his work situation the next day on february 11th matt sent another letter to the lottery corp and basically said that he's been cleared to return to work Nine days later, on February 20th, Matt sent another letter to the Lottery Corp and had a lot to say. For starters, he said that he wanted a new chair that met his needs, a copy of his personnel file, and he wanted to know what was going on. He specifically said, The recent developments have created an environment that does not appear to hold any long-term career growth or promotional opportunities for me within the organization. This type of internal job structuring will undoubtedly not recognize my merit in regards to both past and future work assignments as I will not be performing duties that bring rise to an upgrade within my class. It is my belief that CLC has restricted my growth within the company through a series of loosely constructed arrangements and duties as well as inappropriate job descriptions that did not correspond to my official job classification. I have been placed into a position that offers no room for advancement. I am hoping to have these questions answered in order to alleviate the stressful environment that has been propagated by these conditions. Karen Mahegan, the Director of Human Resources, replied back to Matt that they would work with him to find a chair that met his needs and that he could have his personnel file for $20 and that she couldn't discuss his concerns about work because discussion outside of his grievance forum would be inappropriate. Karen also informed Matt that he could return to work on February 25th, and that on February 27th, he would be meeting with Linda Lynn Arsic, the lottery's chief financial officer, in order to clarify what his job responsibilities are. On March 3rd or Tuesday, Matt went to see Dr. Smith for the last time and told him he returned to work on February 25th. That was it. Matt didn't say anything about how he was or how he felt. On Wednesday, March 4th, it was Matt's father, Donald's 70th birthday, and Matt got him a cake and two pairs of jeans. Donald, Matt, and Matt's mother, Priscilla, all ate cake together, and Matt seemed to be in good spirits. I believe this same day, Matt told a coworker about how easy it would be to build a bomb using information found on the internet. Now on Thursday, March 5th, Matt actually called his union buddy, Joseph Mudry, and asked him when he should be expecting to be getting his back pay and how much additional money it was. Joseph told him, sorry, that there isn't a time limit. Also this same day, Matt left a voicemail to the newspaper, The Current, and specifically to a staff writer named Lynn Bixby at 12.01 p.m. Lynn covered legalized gambling, but on that Thursday, he was out of the office on an assignment until early late Friday morning. The message that Matt said was, Hey Lynn, it's Matt Beck. I was wondering if you would have time to speak with me either in person or perhaps you could give me a call today. It's Thursday the 5th. Thanks. 
I'm looking forward to talking to you. Bye. Uh, relating to lottery issues. Bye. I think Lynn tried to call him back the next day, and you'll find out why, but obviously Matt didn't answer. But Matt's phone had a voicemail that said, Your call is being processed by the T-1000, but I am just a stupid computer. If you leave your name and number or would like to leave a message, my controllers will get back to you. Do it now. Now when the next day rolled around, Matt woke up and in his mind was pure evil. On Friday, March 6th of 1998, Matt Beck woke up with some sort of vengeance. His father was sitting on the couch in the living room in his pajamas and said that Matt woke up very early and then fed his cat, which was named Elsie, short for little cat and also large cat. Matt was brushing his teeth and then passed Donald and said, hi. Afterwards, he went upstairs and put his clothes on and left with his carrying case. However, underneath of his coat, he concealed a 9mm Glock with two magazines and a large hunting knife. Matt passed his father again and told him about his plans to see the movie Titanic with a friend that was a girl that night. Matt then said, well, I'm off. And Donald told him he loved him, as he typically would. Donald said that Matt looked perfectly normal. Nothing was off about him. Matt then left his parents' home. On the front door, there was a sign that said, Trespassers will be shot. Survivors will be shot again. The sign was supposed to be a joke put up by Donald. But Matt drove about one and a half hours away to his job at the Connecticut Lottery Headquarters, located on Alumni Road in Newington. Matt walked towards the front doors, and it was the final day of the work week and about to be the weekend, so the vibes in the place were great. There were approximately 150 people at work this day. Matt walked inside of the building a few minutes late, and normally he would have held the door open if anyone was behind him, and he may have even had a little conversation with them too. That day was different. Behind him walking in was a woman named Irene, and Matt, instead of holding the door for her, let it shut in her face. Irene immediately found that to be very strange, but understood why later down the line. At about 8.35 a.m., an unnamed co-worker of Matt's saw him doing something in the storage closet with the light turned off. She asked, why don't you put the light on? Matt then said, I'm looking for something. His co-worker found this strange, but just walked away. A few minutes later is when a woman named Priscilla, who was a building security officer, and Bob, a security investigator, heard screaming or loud commotion. They went to the source of it to try and figure out what was happening, and this is when they saw Matt walk out of a storage closet and go into the information systems manager's office. That manager's name was Michael Logan, someone who Matt had a problem with because Michael had denied Matt's first grievance. Matt walked into Michael's office and closed the door behind him. Priscilla then knocked on the door and asked if everything was okay. Matt replied back by saying, yeah, everything is okay. It's personal. And also, get out of here. He'll call you back later, very angrily. Priscilla and Bob then went to tell Alfred Dupoy, who was the director of security at the Lottery Corp, about what they just saw and heard. While the three of them were talking, all of a sudden gunshots rang out and basically immediately Alfred called the police. The time was now 8.44 a.m. What happened was that after Priscilla went to tell Alfred, the argument between Matt and Michael became very intense. What was said is not known, but what is known is that Michael pulled out a large hunting knife that he concealed with him and began to attack Michael. A huge fight ensued with furniture flying everywhere. Matt stabbed Michael a total of seven times, and in the middle of the fight, Matt got stabbed in the leg himself. Michael put up one hell of a fight, but unfortunately, it just wasn't enough. Matt pulled out the 9mm block he brought with him and shot Michael twice, killing him. Next, Matt walked out of the room. After this, a co-worker of Matt's saw him and saw the blood on his leg from being stabbed, but the co-worker just assumed it was ink and made a joke. 
I'm unsure how that coworker didn't hear gunfire, but Matt just ignored him. Moments later, Matt walked into a meeting that was held by the lottery's chief financial officer, Linda Mlyn Arsik, the official who met with Matt just a week prior. Inside of this room were six total people in the meeting, which was about a new project that was coming in a few weeks, and I don't know how they didn't hear the gunshots. Perhaps they did. But what happened is that Matt walked into the doorway and with both of his hands pointed the gun at, I believe, the back of Linda's head and said, bye bye or goodbye Linda. It was one of those two. All of a sudden, all hell broke loose because I think people finally realized what was going on and all 115 people inside of the building started to scramble. After this, I believe that Matt went into the office of one of his supervisors, Frederick Rubelman III. Frederick had actually helped him out in the grievance process, but if you remember, Fred also suggested that he be demoted to his previous position. Frederick wasn't in his office, but eventually Matt found him and started chasing him throughout the building, shooting at him. Matt shot him a total of four times, twice in the back as he chased him, and while Frederick was on the ground, Matt shot him one last time in the head, killing him. Next, Matt began to look around and try to find one last person. That was Otho Brown, the lottery's president. Matt also went into Otho or Ott's office looking for him and couldn't find him, but eventually he saw him running around outside trying to escape with a ton of other people. Matt started chasing him around the parking lot well over 100 yards with Ott yelling, No! Matt, no! Now either right here, Ott fell while he was running away and then Matt shot him, or the other way around. But Ott fell on the ground and at this point he was shot in the hip. He was screaming at Matt saying that he has a family and kids, but Matt didn't care. Many employees were right near the scene while this was happening, hiding in the woods behind trees. Some of them were yelling no and screaming and some had to cover their eyes. Matt told Ott to shut up and then shot him twice in the head, killing him instantly. At this exact moment, two police officers had arrived to the scene and both of them watched as Matt turned slightly and with a single bullet took himself out. Some reports say he shot twice, but I believe it was once. With that final act, Matthew Beck was officially dead and so were four other innocent people. What a tragedy. After this happened, Matt's parents were at home and listening to the radio when they heard about a shooting at the lottery headquarters. They heard that the shooter was an employee who recently filed a grievance. Matt's parents said, oh my God, and looked at each other because they immediately knew exactly who it was, their son. Then their home phone started ringing like crazy from Matt's friends to the police. Eventually, the police went to their house and told them what happened, and they broke down. Neither of them ever expected this, and especially because the morning seemed perfectly fine. They responded to the media by saying this. What our son Matt did was wrong, terribly wrong. Nothing anyone can say can justify or condone his actions. In spite of the support of co-workers, the love and help from his friends and family and the treatment, counseling, and medication from his doctors, he chose the wrong path, a path of hopelessness when other avenues were open before him. Unfortunately and tragically, he decided to take others with him. His murderous act was monstrous, but he was not a monster, as his friends and family can attest. At this time of grief for many, we offer our sincere sympathy to all of the families and apologize for Matt. I cannot ask you to forgive him, for we have not yet forgiven him for what he did. He failed his co-workers, his friends, his family, and most of all himself. We love you, Matt, but why? Also, Donald, Matt's father, said that he regrets taking him to the hospital the year prior while he was ODing, which I can't blame him. I have no idea why Matthew Beck did what he did, besides that he was angry because of being demoted and having someone else take the upper position, also feeling like he was wronged in a few ways. It's bizarre because it seemed as if Matt was going to get some money for his troubles. Unfortunately, he just had to wait. 
also the fact that he was applying to different jobs and most likely had one. Another thing was that Matt that week had bought a bunch of yogurt and a ton of cider, he purchased supplies for his cat, and that night he was supposed to see Titanic. Whether or not Matt had planned this in its entirety will never be known. It's obvious that he had some sort of plan, and that was to kill whoever he believed wronged him. His ex-girlfriend was at work that day with her new boyfriend who also worked there. They started dating around the time that Matt actually stopped going to work. It was said that Matt didn't target her and would have definitely seen her. Another interesting thing is that many people at the Lottery Corp, after Matt came back to work, were afraid of him. Employees there were joking about the fact that Matt was probably going to go postal someday, and he sure did. A big thing here is I also mentioned security guards earlier. Well, the Lottery Corp used to have paid security guards who were armed. But then, in 1996, that changed, and instead of having armed guards, they hired four guards who weren't armed. That alone could have made the difference in what happened that day. Regardless, none of that warrants a death sentence to four innocent people. What Matt did was absolutely awful, and that's all he'll be remembered for. Michael Thomas, Logan was 33 years old and was the lottery's manager of information systems, and he had just been promoted to that position in March of 1997. He was only hired by the Lottery Corp in 1996. Friends and colleagues said he was a computer wizard and always willing to help. Logan had a wife named Margaret and a very loving family, including two children, and people looked at him as the nicest guy in the world and the nicest guy to work for. Linda Blogoslawski Lynn Arsik was 38 years old and the lottery's chief financial officer. She was in charge of supervising and recruiting a staff of about 28 people, and she oversaw all the accounting, purchasing, and budgeting for the lottery operation, which was about $700 million at the time. Not only that, but Linda was the first female mayor of a town called New Britain, which has a population of about 70,000 people. After losing her re-election in 1995, which devastated her, she joined the state lottery in September of 1996. Friends said that she seemed happier in the lottery job. Linda had no kids, but had a husband who absolutely loved her named Peter, and he wrote an entire excerpt about her and reading it was sad. Frederick William Rubelman III was 40 years old and he was the vice president of operations and administrations at the lottery corp. Rick, as he liked to go by, was also married and had two children. He was a churchgoer, he brewed his own homemade beer, and was looked at as a selfless person. It said that for anyone who knew him, they knew he was a great guy. Rick had been helping people go the right way to get out of the building while Matt was shooting. Unfortunately, Matt had caught up to him and murdered him in cold blood. Otho Raymond Brown was 54 years old and the president of the Connecticut Lottery for about four years. Otho, or Ott as he went by, was a husband and father of a boy and twin girls. Ott was looked at as one of the biggest and most gentle men people would ever meet, and he was very tall as well. Ott was a tough guy who was very focused on making money, and he did just that. Not one of these people deserved such a tragic fate, and I hope that they're all resting peacefully. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please like and subscribe because it's all we do. I also have an all-exclusive Patreon if you're interested in that. There's a bunch of tiers to choose from, and the third one allows for you to see a Patreon-only video, and that tier and the second one allow you to have your name at the end of each High Time Crime video. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.